So again, welcome. Thank you for joining us for episode three of the Environment Office's nuclear webinar series. Um, if you're just joining us, we're just giving it a couple minutes just to allow some last minute people to sign in. But for those of you that are signed in, um, I'd be interested to learn where you're tuning in from. So if you just wanna type in your city in the chat, that'd be pretty interesting to see. Victoria, BC, welcome. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to episode three of the Environment Office's nuclear webinar series. My name is April and I'm the Community Engagement Manager with the Soggy and Ojibwe Nation Environment Office. So if this is your first time joining us, thank you. Uh, we will be hosting these webinars every other Wednesday and they're gonna be featuring a different topic each week. The goal of these webinars is to give you information on issues and topics that surround the nuclear industry within the territory. So before we get started, we're just gonna review those buttons that I was kind of talking about earlier um, and how you're gonna interact with us during the webinar. So the first button you're gonna see is the chat button um, and that'll allow you to send messages to myself and the other panelists. And we'll try to answer those as best we can. And we also have the raise hand button which should be in the middle of your screen. Um, so when you hit this, we'll just kind of see an indication that you've raised your hand and we'll send you a private message just to see what's happening there. And finally, we have the Q&A button. So try and put your questions there just to kind of keep them separate from the chat box uh, because we'll have some time at the end of the presentations where we're gonna answer those questions. Um, so you'll also notice that I have turned on subtitles for this webinar. Uh, I do wanna just let you know that they are auto-generated. So they will get some words wrong um, here and there and they will definitely get the Ojibwe words wrong, which I do apologize for, but kind of the best option at the moment. So I'm gonna let my colleague introduce herself. She's my co-host here. And let me just change that screen view here. Okay. Annie Bojo, Wabamikisque uh, Indishnaka, Makwa Nodem Neashinarin Donshaba. My name is Carlene Kijik. I'm the Community Outreach Associate for the Saugin Ojibwe Nation Environment Office. Thank you. Thanks, Carlene. All right, so to get started, um, earlier this year, the Environment Office sent out a community notice on NWMO's proposed project for a high-level waste DGR. Um, in that document, we referenced how NWMO would be starting work on borehole digging in the spring of 2021. So that work is going to be starting soon, which is why today's focus is on boreholes. So joining us today, we have Julie Brown. Um, PhD PGO, Senior Project Officer with the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And we also have David Wolf from David F. Wood Consulting. Oh, sorry, David Wood, not Wolf. <laughs> so welcome, Julie and David, and thank you for joining us. I look forward to learning more and having a better understanding of the work that NWMO will be starting soon. My gracious. So I'd first like to hear from uh, David. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and explaining a little bit about your background before moving into your slides, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, Anin, David Ndijnikas, uh, England Ndunjiba, um, and I live in Sudbury. I live in Sudbury, which is on the traditional lands of Anishinaabek, Tikamishing uh, Anishinaabek and the Wanamate First Nation. And it's also on the lands of the Robinson Huron Treaty, and we're all treaty members, so we all work together on this. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to talk to you. I'm an engineering geologist. Um, I've spent many, many years looking at rock core from exploration work. I work as a consultant up in Sudbury, and I deal mostly with rock fall hazard. But my role is predominantly to talk to rocks. So my my position here is to let you know what the rocks are thinking when you go and put a borehole into them. And if we're ready to start, I can put the borehole slideshow up. Um, whoops, 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 whoops. Wait a minute. Hang on, let me just stop sharing and go back to the beginning of this. Um, I'm not quite sure. I, you know, these things always get you, don't they? Yep, you think you're ready and then something pops up. 
Why is it going to this slide here? Um, maybe just hit play from beginning. Yeah. There we go. Does that get that? That's up on the screen now, is it? It is, yes. You're good to okay. go, David. All right. So we're going to talk about boreholes as quickly as we can. Um, and the idea is to try and understand what they're for and what they're all about. So the principal reason that we get involved with boreholes uh, for the work that you're talking about is for site investigation, is to try and evaluate the geology and hydrogeology of a rock mass. And hydrogeology is just the combination of water and geology. So it's the underground water conditions um, rather than surface water and it, how it affects the rock mass itself. So there are a number of things that you can look at. Um, borehole is a very general term and there are other terms that you can use like well and drill hole and core hole. But a borehole is a deep, narrow hole made in the ground and they're, they're usually to locate water, oil, or gas. Um, that's what most people would suggest. Uh, it's drilled by a machine and it is relatively small in diameter. Now, some water wells are excavated by hand and relatively large in diameter. These are, are wells that people would use to, to drop buckets down and so on to get, to get water. But oil and gas wells are the same idea of a borehole, but drilled with very large equipment. A drill hole is a borehole produced by a drill, which means it's rotating specifically rather than hammering. And these are usually made for exactly our purposes we're looking at here, exploration or investigation. And a core hole is drilled using a hollow drill bit, which is coated with different types of synthetic diamonds, and it extracts whole rock samples from the ground. And these rock samples are called cores, and they are what we are looking at to characterize the ground, to look at the lithology and the structural features within the rock mass. Now, very often a well, which is to extract oil or gas or water from the ground, will be left open after it's been completed, whereas a core hole is usually sealed after drilling to make sure all the original ground conditions are maintained and to prevent any migration or contamination of any materials within the ground. So that makes a bit of a difference there between a well and a core hole. So a few basics about the proposed NWMO boreholes. Um, they are looking at the rock mass around 500 meters, which is around 1500 feet below surface. So on the surface where you are in the Bruce Peninsula, you've got limestone. But below there, at some depth, you're going back into the Canadian Shield, and the Canadian Shield is the basement rock that we have up here in Sudbury. So the boreholes need to go down around 500 meters, which is quite a long way down. The core method is the only way of collecting samples from this target area. So we're saying that the area around 500 meters is the target that they're looking for recovering information about the rocks and also the water of that area. And the coring method is the only way to get samples from that area. That's why we're using a borehole. What it does is it grinds away a small amount of rock as the core barrel advances down into the, into the ground and the core is collected inside in a core tube. When the core has been recovered and the empty hole is tested, it's usually filled in and cemented at the surface. So one of the things here that's very important is um, by the time you've drilled the hole, you often use it then for further testing. So you can use geophysical methods to test the hole as well. If you think that you have missed your target, you can use the top, say, 400 meters of borehole and deviate the hole at 400 meters to go and select a new target. So you can use the, the top part of the borehole and have different lower parts of a borehole to find out different areas. The borehole is always surveyed for location and the drill rods are all the same length, so you know where the bit is located. You know where your target is, you know where you've got to. Um, the number of borings that you need depends on many, many issues. There are probably too many to go through here. I gather from the uh, discussions I've had with April that there are a few boreholes being planned, at least two, 
um, probably there are two, two areas or they're looking at two locations within one area. Yeah. Oops. All right. So these are some examples of some older style drill rigs. These are ones that, that I, I've used these to look at mining exploration and so on. These are long year drill rigs. Um, they will go down 2000 feet. So they would get at least 500 meters. Uh, these are relatively small diameter holes that you can drill with these. So what types of drilling are there? So you've got percussion drills which are the sorts of things you see being used for rock excavation on highways and railways. Um, these are hammers that, that hit the rock, rotate, hit the rock, rotate, hit the rock, rotate, as they're going into the ground. And you can't collect a sample. All you can see from this is dust and, and sand that comes up from the, from the rock. Um, so you can't get a sample, uh, but it allow you to get into the ground pretty quickly, but only a short distance. So this would be limited to probably mm, 100 feet or so. Rotary drills are the ones where you've got a rotating drilling part going on. And these are uh, broken down into two sorts for rock. They're coring. And in soils, they are augering. So what happens in soils is you auger down and then take a sample from inside the auger. The examples that I've shown here, the, the, the ones of the uh, older types of drill rigs and the new ones that we're looking at in a moment, they're all rotary rigs. And the rotary rigs used to be that you'd drill from having all the pipe all stuck together. And when you've got your drill, your drilled core, you take everything out of the ground and then put everything back in again. Nowadays, the rods stay in, in the hole, the drill rods stay in the hole and the core is recovered through wireline process. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are the very modern rigs that they're using now. And the one on the left here, you can see it's a much bigger piece of equipment um, with a large rack out the back, which is where all the, all the drill rods are held. And you can see that incline part there where I've got my cursor, that's the drill rod that's being picked up from the drill stand to go into the hole. And the one on the right here, shows the possibilities for incline drilling. So you can you don't have to drill vertical holes, you can drill them at an angle if you want to, and that helps determine a bunch of things, a bunch of other things. Now on the left here, these are the diamond impregnated bits that are used. So you can see the surface around this one here. That's the rock that's ground away and the core goes into the core goes into the middle here. And so these obviously are upside down compared to the way they would normally be attached to the bottom of rods. And on the right hand side here, this is the device which the wire line clips onto this top end here and pulls this whole system out of the hole. And the core barrel is at the bottom of this. That's where the rock is, is brought up from the ground. So in terms of the evaluation, the main purpose of this core hole is to recover rock samples. And specimens of the rock are then taken for testing. The rock can be used to describe the rock mass. And you're also looking for the presence of water in, in this work that you're doing. So this is a much smaller investigation rig. And this is a project I was working on in Sudbury about a year ago. So this is a little track mounted rig um, with uh, hydraulic couplers. Here you can see on this rack, this is the auger they use for soils drilling, and this is a hollow auger. And then they're drilling here with a diamond drill rig, a diamond bit to recover core samples. So this is what they're looking for. This is the whole point of this. This is a core box. Uh, it's about five feet long or a meter and a half long. And this is n size core. So these are samples of core that are recovered from the ground at depths here shown 14, 15, 16 feet, and so on, um, in, the, in the rock mass in Sudbury. After you've drilled a whole bunch of core, this is the whole, uh, a complete hole here. So this has been sprayed with water to pick up the details, but you can see it's very good quality rock. There are hardly any breaks and fractures in it. And this is what you're looking for to try and determine what the condition of the ground is in at depth that you can't see. The only way you can see it is by looking at the core that you've recovered from the ground. 
When you're looking at core logging, what are you trying to do? You're looking at a number of characteristics of the rock, the weathering, the structure, the color, the grain size, the rock material strength, and the rock name. And you're also looking for the details about the fracturing and how they affect the overall quality. So you're looking at what the rock block size would be like, the rock block shape, and the rock mass quality. Those are the key characteristics of the purpose of doing core logging. In addition to that, we're looking for the influence of water. So if it's an underground excavation, you need to know about drainage and inflow. You need to know about water pressure and you need to know about permeability. So these are all um, parts of the information you can collect during a borehole program. Additional testing can be done. So if you've got a hole in the ground, you can then put probes down there and you can look at the geophysical character of the ground, including the magnetic condition of the rocks, the seismic condition, resistivity, which is to do with uh, electricity, gravity, and so on. All of these different methods are used to evaluate the ground that the hole is going through. You're trying to find the characteristics of the ground at depth that you can't see from the surface. Then for hydrogeological testing, you can do packer tests where you isolate a section of the hole and you pump water into it or out of it. And this looks at the permeability. So this helps you with the drainage of underground openings, water inflow and pumping needs. You can install a piezometer, which will measure the water pressure at depth and the movement of water. And you can also measure the water table in the open hole for the presence of water in the upper levels of development. So you need to know where water is coming in and where water is going out of the borehole to help you understand what the characteristics are of the underground water condition. This is a, another photograph of that most modern piece of equipment. And you can see here, this part to the right-hand side is the drill rods connected together and the core barrel is on the end. So this end part here is the part that goes into the ground and that's where the core is collected. So I thank you very much for your attention. If there are any questions, you can ask them now or put them into the chat. So is that what you wanted to do there, April? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you, David. So if you just wouldn't mind, um, I guess, taking off your share screen yep. and then we'll just have you there. Yep. Um, now I accidentally turned off your video there. So if you just wanna start your video again, there I'm you are. back up. You're back here. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks, David. Um, you know, that was a lot of information and you yes. like, clearly like let us know what those boreholes are and how they work and like the importance of those. So thank you for that. I think the real key is that a borehole is the only way we have of getting information from a depth like 500 meters or, or 1500 feet below surface. There's no other way of getting that information. Um, the I real key to this is that these boreholes are exploration and not for um, the purposes of removing anything from the ground other than the rock. So they're not left in place to be used for removing oil or gas afterwards. Okay. So Julie, I noticed you were trying to say something, but I couldn't quite hear you. Yeah, no, can you hear me okay? Yes. I can hear you now, yes. I, can, I thought this would be a good, place for me to kind of introduce myself and what my role is at um, uh, because it's pretty relevant and I think all of that information that David presented they're they're really great illustrations and I think that's a really good resource for people wanting to know what a borehole is and if you google on the internet just like David says you find boreholes for different purpose mm -hmm. and the boreholes that NWMO is looking at are characterization boreholes for the bedrock and um, that is a good match for where I would come in because um, I am a, a geologist and my background, you know, as a was walk across the land and make geological maps of the bedrock. And so you're kind of like solving a mystery about what the what the bedrock is doing. And then I continued my studies and I worked a little bit in mineral exploration, but all of the time it was using that information from the rock to solve a problem. And um, that's essentially what I do at CNSC. 
And that's why I was hired was to use my experience and knowledge of rocks to evaluate the safety of a DGR. And the way it always has to start, no matter what, is they get information from the surface. So you have surface-based information. And then they have to drill a hole and extract the core to confirm that information and to get more information. And so that, that's basically what I look at when I do my, my job <laughs> at CNSC. And so I've been there since 2012. And since that time, I've been working on deep geological repository projects. So yeah, that's, that's who I am and what I do. And um, you know, I, there's so much information out there. It is actually, it took, like even as a, a geologist, it took me a long time to build that, that knowledge. And so it's, it's really good that um, this is a great place to come to start and get information. And mm -hmm. I really appreciate you including me today in this session. Yes. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. I think one, one point that's really, really useful here, Julie, um, when you were talking about, you know, as a geologist tramping across the ground, you're looking at the rocks at surface. And the real key is that the rocks at surface are not always, in fact, very rarely, are they the same as rocks at depth. And, you know, rocks have got different rocks of whether they're sedimentary or metamorphic or igneous and so on, have got different characteristics. And so you need to understand the characteristics of the rock masses themselves to know how to interpret what you are seeing at the surface as to what you might see at depth. But obviously, if you need to get down 500 meters, the only way to get down there is using a borehole. That's right. It's, it's evidence. And yeah. So they get, I think if you look at what the NWMO is doing, they'll pick the best place to drill a borehole. And it depends on what the purpose is for. We know quite a lot about the geology of Southern Ontario where they would be drilling. And um, so they would pick a spot and then you have the chance to verify it and to see if, if the rock that you expect. Um, I saw a question in the chat, it just popped up. Um, and I missed it, but I think one of the things, like the, when you say about characteristics of a DGR at depth, like for a, a 500 meters depth, they're looking for something that's predictable and stable. And so, you know, actually all of those things in David's list about the information that you're going to evaluate, that's what I get to evaluate. I evaluate their evidence for what kind of fracturing, what water inflows. So what are the levels that you have water inflows? And that connection between the repository level and the surface, is there a connection that's connected by fractures in the rock or faults? And um, that's something that they have to evaluate in their characterization with boreholes. I see this great question, actually. I just, it's in the chat. How do you determine dynamism of rock movement through time at depth? And this is actually what geology can contribute to. And it's partially because the rock record is so old and we're not used to um, in human timeframes, they have to evaluate whether a DGR is gonna be safe for a million years, which is a really long time for you and I but it's not very long in terms of the rock record. So those, the rocks in the South Bruce Peninsula are hundreds of millions of years old, and they have a record of any movement that has happened through faults and fractures. And you can actually, um, we know, it's called the study of uh, tectonics and structural geology. And through that information, as well as just the, the record of the shaking of the ground through earthquakes, so that's the seismic hazard. And together that information about where faults and structures are, together with the record of earthquakes, we can um, actually just get evidence for what you would expect for shaking of the ground to happen over the time frame of, of 1 million years that a DGR has to be safe for. That's great. Um, so I see that we do have another question in our chat. So I'll just read that out to you. 
It says, how do you triangulate samples across broad spaces in the rock across appropriate distances to ensure the holes are representative of the area's rock rocks? That's actually also a very interesting question. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have a first go at this. You can come up, you can add, add to it in a minute. Um, the, the most interesting thing here is, is within something like a DGR, there is a requirement for a degree of uniformity across a certain distance. So that's absolutely true here, um, John. Uh, you're looking at the, the space that would be required for an underground repository, and you would need to determine that within that area and an area larger than it, um, that everything is relatively uniform. If you look at a tunnel, the zone of influence around the tunnel is normally about two diameters of the tunnel. So if you have a, a large excavation, which would have an underground repository, the zone of influence would be two or three times that size. So that's the area that you'd have to investigate with your drill holes. So I think the idea about triangulating samples across broad spaces, you would want to start off with, you know, if you're actually doing a design for this rather than just an, uh, an evaluation, you'd need to have quite a lot of boreholes covering the area. And if everything is looking equal everywhere, then it's an easy assumption to make that it's the same in the middle. If things are different around the site, then you have to put more boreholes down to try and find out where the differences are. In a, in a mining environment, the, very, the, the most critical features are faults. And faults are the things that affect mining incredibly. And those are the things that uh, they're really, really looking for during a lot of drilling programs to make sure they can understand where the faulting is that affects where the rock mass changes. And the same thing would apply for a DGR in the work that we're doing. Julie. So that, that, was, that was a good answer. And I will just add to it that um, we don't have a recipe for the number of um, boreholes that you would need to characterize a certain rock mass because it's really specific to a given location. Um, for a DGR, one thing that's really different from a mining project is that um, the rock is really homogeneous. You know, I used to get offended when one of my colleagues would say, we're looking for a boring rock. And I was like, no rocks are boring, but that is, you want a homogeneous rock mass, just like David had said. And um, so you wouldn't have any um, natural resources there. You would want to um, make sure that you're, so it's kind of, it's a little bit different from a mining project where you would probably expect to have quite a few fracture zones. And then, um, but from a DGR, you'd want to know where your fracture zones, all rocks are fractured. So there will be fracture zones that they will characterize. And you want to have a realistic picture of what the rock is like at the depth. And the only way to do that is to, you, you do have to start from the surface. <laughs> you collect that information and then there will always be fractures in the rock and you use your, you plan where your boreholes are. And one, one reason I, I really like working for the regulator is that I get to evaluate if um, the plan that they have to characterize the rock for a, a given phase of their project, if they have enough information. And, and that's how uh, we look at their, their drill plans. And I should clarify that I work for the regulator and for NWMO's project, we don't, um, they don't have, they're not licensed by us right now. So everything that we do is in a pre-licensing period, but we do learn about what they're doing and do some work on that project so that when we do get the information in support of a license application in a few years, should they submit one, um, we would evaluate all of that information against all of these things. Like, do you think you have enough information to proceed to the next phase of the project? So. I think an another point to, to add would be the fact that um, you know, you mentioned seismic evaluation and so on. It's a very important part. I mean, one of the things that we do as geologists is we act as forensics. You know, we, we look forensically at the information and try and interpret what it was like a thousand years ago, what it was like a million years ago, what it was like a thousand million years ago for the rocks that I'm dealing with very often up here. And obviously, 
if we are considering a DGR, seismic activity is a real key. So there are locations within Ontario where there are lower seismic risk areas and there are also higher seismic risk areas. And I do believe that the two, um, the two areas that NWMO are looking at at the moment are very low seismic risk areas as well. So we're not really worried so much about um, seismic activity, earthquake activity in these specific areas. Oh, interesting one from John here. <laughs> what depth does the layer of limestone extend generally and what depth does the Canadian Shield manifest? Does the relationship between the rock layers indicate anything about the seismic hydrological character of the area? Very, very interesting, John. Um, yes to all of this. I mean, uh, the, the limestone layers, which we know uh, incorporate the, um, the Niagara Escarpment, so we know there are thousands of feet of, or there were thousands of feet of these sediments originally, um, they've been eroded away and eroded away. So I don't personally know at the moment how far down it is the Canadian Shield. The Canadian Shield will be underneath those rocks. Those rocks there are 500 million year old Ordovician limestones. Um, the Canadian Shield is about two and a half billion years old. Um, the layers and so on, the, 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 the granitic type of rock would be the basement, the, uh, pre, the Precambrian Shield is, is sort of a granitic, granitic gneiss and the limestone above there. Um, the only thing you can tell about the, you can't tell me about the seismic conditions. Hydrologically, um, there will be differences between the limestone and the Precambrian bedrock because of the solubility of the limestone in some locations. So there will be more passage of groundwater through limestone than there will be through um, the Precambrian Shield. Julie. This is great. So I also enjoy this question. Um, so it, because it varies, that's the answer, right? Like the, how, how, what depth does the layer of limestone extend? So I'm, if you know the King Carden area close to um, uh, the lake, is that Lake Huron? I'm having a shocker. I think it's Lake Huron. And so at that point, um, the, you're in limestone at the surface and the Canadian Shield is about a kilometer down, maybe a little bit less. And then as you go farther to the east, uh, that limestone later gets thinner. So it will probably maybe be a little bit thinner, I think where they're planning to um, drill their first borehole, NWMO's first borehole is, it'll probably be a little bit thinner, the limestone that's on top of the granite. But you know, it's, I'm in Ottawa and um, the Ottawa River is, is right next to me. And I'm, my office, my, in my house right now is on top of limestone eventually. When I cross the river, um, the Ottawa River is a fault. So on the other side of the river, you've had um, the Canadian Shield is right there. It's been lifted up to the surface hundreds of millions of years ago. <laughs> but still, there, that's a great example. Um, um, yeah, there, there's another amazing place um, along Highway 400 between Sudbury and Toronto, where you come down across the Severn River, uh, the end of the, of the Severn Canal, uh, Seven, Trent Severn Waterway, you're in the Canadian Shield and you come around a corner and up a slight rise and there's a Canadian Shield outcrop of rock, which is two and a half billion years old. And then a hundred meters further on, there's limestone. And that limestone is only 500 million years old. And I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking for that contact. I'm trying to find where we've lost 2000 million years of history. So I would imagine that the, um, the preferred location would be in a shield rock mass rather than a sedimentary limestone. No, there's um, good qualities to either one. Okay, okay. So it's, it really depends on the site and no matter what, they have to collect all the information on the predictability, the stability, um, where the faults are, what the seismic hazard is for that location. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it can have it will have low seismic risk. They're either of those locations yeah. are the lowest, like most stable uh, intercontinental locations in in the world. Actually, Canada is fortunate in that way, but um, they still have to characterize all of it based on the evidence from the boreholes and water inflows. 
and that that relationship between the rock layers is um it's it it's really crucial i think for seismicity it's more um the the faults and the fractures um, but they could be hosted in the basement rocks. When we say basement, that's the Canadian shield, but that, that's the kind of information that, that we would need. And so the connection is also that you can get flow along the fractures. You can have flow in a layer of rock, so in a limestone, like, and David, this is exactly what you said. You would have more odds of finding a layer of rock that has water in it in the limestone, but, um, you know, you can have, it, it could also flow up a fracture. So they need to characterize all of those things. And it's, you can get just numbers on it and that, that evidence from a borehole. Sorry about that, it's my phone. You know what, something that occurs to me is that um, it's a lot of these concepts are maybe easier to show if you have a picture to talk to you like David did with the boreholes. And so if there is interest at another time and um, it's possible to bring pictures to talk to these concepts it, and, um, and it, it's, geology is a great opportunity to illustrate those concepts. And you can test if you're like, uh, you don't explain that very well. That's, please uh, let us know. <laughs> we could improve, you know? Of course. So that was some great discussion, uh, David and Julia. Um, so we just have one final comment. I think we'll end on this comment or question here. So I'll just read it. It's from John. It says, next to the Lake Huron, is there still rebounding from glaci glaciation 12,000 to 14,000 years ago still take place in this area? Are there variations in rebound rates if this happens? If so, can this be determined by borehole samples or would all the rock layers rise and fall together, thus making the borehole evidence difficult to predict such factors? So in other words, do all the rocks rise and fall at the same time? So if I didn't clear that, you can read it in the chat, but I tried to. Later. I'll start off with, I'll start off and pass it on to Julie in a moment. Um, mm -hmm. There is much less rebound in the lower parts of the, what's called the Paleozoic, which is the younger rocks, than further north in the purely uh, Precambrian shield rocks. Um, the, I mean, the areas in Finland and Sweden are doing the same thing. The, the rock, the weight of the rock, the weight of the ice that's being removed has allowed the rock to relax and rebound and, and rise up. It's happening very, 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 very slowly. Um, everything is moving pretty well together. So the last part of the question here, do all the rocks rise and fall at the same time? Basically, yes. So the load is taken off from the surface by removal of rock weight, by glaciation, and also the weight of ice. Um, and following that, the, uh, the rock rebounds. Now, obviously the thickness of ice up here in Sudbury was a lot more than it would be down there in the Bruce Peninsula. So up here, we had something like two kilometers of ice. Um, and that thickness would be a considerable weight. There was less thickness of ice down in the uh, Bruce Peninsula area. So there would be less load taken off and the rebound rates would be less. Julie. So this is a, one of those characteristics that needs to be evaluated because we're in Canada and um, any place, so either place that the NWMO is looking at will have been uh, pretty like in geological time relatively recently glaciated as you've indicated in your question. And so, um, you can get evidence from boreholes depending on the rock type that relates and you can perform your investigation and solve your mystery and get data that informs your assessment of the impact that glaciation had, just like David said, because um, those rocks in both of those places, they've been subject to about nine or 10 glacial cycles in the last million years. So evidence from those glaciations is precedent 
not present, is present um, in, the, in the rocks. So they experienced 10 glacial cycles. And um, so we expect that this, where we are right now, we will be covered with a really thick ice sheet, like David said, um, you know, it, and it will have, so we have to have a repository that can withstand future glaciations, as well as um, showing that it remained resilient to past glaciations. And that's the kind of evidence and information we get from geology. So it's, we have a record in these rocks. These rocks are really old. So a million years is like a blink of an eye, but they do have this, these multiple glacial cycles. And I have to show that they've been resilient um, to those glacial cycles because um, it has to be safe for a million years. So it's a key um, factor that we need to understand how it will perturb a repository, whether the repository will perform as it's intended. Perfect, thank you. So I think that was our final question there. Um, I do appreciate you both taking the time to answer those questions for us. Um, I think that'll be the end of like that presentation. So if you have any closing remarks before Carlene and I kind of end up end the webinar here, I'll let you both have those final statements. I can just say uh, very quickly that I think it's really um, important to have scientists be able to explain the science to people that it impacts. And um, so that's something that I think that I, I can get better at. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to come and meet people that are actually interested in the science. And um, I would also appreciate having seen David's presentation and I would welcome any opportunity to come back in the future and uh, try out some of my other material on you if it's helpful mm -hmm. and of interest. Thank you, I really appreciate it. I would agree entirely. I think it's a great opportunity to be able to work with um, work with anybody from anywhere to describe and explain what we understand of the ground. Um, understanding and education go go together so well that clarity comes by education and understanding comes through education. And um, if we can be open and honest with all participants about what we do as geologists and what the results turn into, I think we're all going to be much better off. So I would uh, like to say chi miigwech to, uh, to April to, for inviting us to come along here and say that I am also available at any time um, to, to talk about these things further. And um, if there's an opportunity while the while borehole activity is going on, I would willingly come down to visit um, from Sudbury here to talk to you about what's going on, point at things around the drill rig and tell you how, how it all works. Um, that's fine. Thank you, David. And thank you, Julie. So I'll let Carlene talk a little here. <laughs> Thank you, April. Um, again, I just wanted to thank uh, David and Julie for the presentations. You did an excellent job on uh, presenting to our membership on what um, boreholes actually are. I think, you know, that um, through our process, you know, not understanding the, the full picture on what that actually is. I think uh, with the presentation, you've, you've, you've helped that out quite a bit and answered some really uh, valuable questions there. Um, as part of our process, because we are still going through a uh, community process and informing membership of the proposed project by NWMO. Um, we, um, because this is the beginning stage for us, we wanted to also have on site um, borehole drilling monitors. So go to the boreholes and, and just kind of see what's happening and kind of relay back to um, membership communities on what's happening and what's there. Um, because it, it is important that through this whole process, um, as it is still a proposed project, we haven't gotten to uh, whether there is going to actually be a project or not. We're still at the very beginning stages, but we wanted our membership to um, be there from start to finish and um, just trying to inform um, our communities a little bit better than we did on the last uh, on the last project. So just stay tuned. There's more to come. Thanks, Carlene. 
So that concludes um, our webinar today. So thanks again, Julie and David, and thank you everyone for tuning in to episode three and spending the last 45, 50 minutes with us learning about boreholes and what they are. And I hope you all took something away and that you know it was very informative for you as well. So just a reminder as well, um, these webinars are recorded and we will be posting them on the members portal of our new website. Um, so just look for those in the next few days or the next week. We just have to download them, edit them a bit, and then we'll be posting those. So be sure to check that out. So miigwech and see you on the next episode.